Hello and welcome to LedgerCast. My name is Brian Krogsgaard and I am here as per usual with Josh Ulswich. Hey, Josh. Hey, Brian. How's it going? Good. Welcome to LedgerCast. I think I said that. Uh, I'm off my game <laughs> right now, sitting here thinking about this 30x that I missed on some ICO in 2018. The, the days where it was impossible to make money on an ICO and I got in the one that was amazing and then sold it and didn't realize how well it had done since then until just now. So hate to see it. Hate to see it. Not that I <laughs> bought the ICO. I bought it OTC. Of course. Right. Just making that clear for everybody. Right. Anybody that might be curious. Speak, speak clearly and into the microphone, please. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we were talking about before the, uh, we started the show how if you're not in DeFi right now, it seems like there's not a whole lot going on. It's not totally true, but it seems like it is at least relatively true. What's been your kind of lay of the land recently? What's, what's, is there anything exciting anywhere? Yeah, sure. So if your overarching thesis is in a bear market, everything is correlated. In a, in a, in a bull market, we have individual coins moving. That's sort of the scenario we have right now, I think, right? Like we have a bunch of stuff moving that I just would never touch with anything ever. Like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm putting money on the table and leaving it there by not trading it, but uh, I just don't have the bandwidth to pay attention to much of this stuff, you know? Yeah. You definitely, Mainly the DeFi stuff, but. You definitely have to be aware of, you know, what's moving and what's not uh, because Bitcoin is not moving and, uh, to be able to be in the know enough on all the other stuff, you got to be flexible. You got to be ready for handling liquidity for whatever you're trying to purchase. And you got to, um, you know, know when it's time to get in, know when it's time to get out. You can do all that with price and everything, but there's more to it than that, especially from a timing perspective. Um, and we've seen that even with something like Doge, everything happened in like two days and then it's just been down or side, you know, down mostly down <laughs> for like a week since but <coughs> if you just sat through all that passively like you did you're up but it's not not what it could have been if you paid attention to every little minute of the market so if you're really taking advantage of things now you're kind of knowing when to when to do what um, well you have to be nimble and agile but like okay like if you sold snx on the first pump like if you compare it to doge for example you know, you're missing a ton of upside. So it's like, eh, I don't know. You, I guess you have to flow with the FOMO a little bit. Yeah. And um, you have to be ready. I, I don't know. Flow, go with the FOMO. Flow with the FOMO. That's for sure. Um, I just hate trading stuff that doesn't have a year's worth of history, trading history. Yeah. There's been some good points, though, out there from people that I respect that trade altcoins and stuff. And, you know, they make they make the point that the action is essentially by following the newer stuff, you know, the things that don't have bag holders. Um, and it's easier to catch price discovery and off you go. Um, however, with the Bollinger Band hint of volatility coming soon because of a complete and historical lack of it currently, um, you got to think the music will probably stop here before too long. So I did this. Altcoin. I did this beautiful, gorgeous, sweeping altcoin video last night at around four a.m. and uh, youtubecom slash <laughs> and <laughs> and that's basically what I said. I'm like, everything, you know, alts are relatively bullish individually, and I expect everything to go south when um, BTC drops, which I expect to happen based yeah. on where we well, sit even if, currently. Even if BTC breaks up on a relative basis, altcoins are probably going to struggle against whatever Bitcoin does purely because which of is, volatility. Which is why alts always do best usually when Bitcoin is sideways. Which Bitcoin certainly is. And if we look at, if we compare B vol, uh, Bitcoin volatility, which is the white for people watching the stream or video later, mm -hmm. um, the bottom half here, Bitcoin volatility versus um, total market cap minus BTC in general when we're sideways when BVOL is declining or you know at all time lows it's been pretty bullish for alts yeah market cap goes up while volatility goes down yeah 
So if you follow that volatility trend, you might be able to snag something out of there. Yeah, and just as the V-Bands show, we are as tight as we were in 2018 before the massive drop down. One thing I said in the video too is 2018, we had Bitfinex and Tether on the verge of collapsing. We had Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, BSV, Civil War. And we also had legacy market downturn, um, which all helped propel the 2018 move yeah, to, so to what, the downside. What helps propel it now? I mean, fundamentally, everything looks good. Even the narrative and the, uh, the press is even not that bad. Even with this Twitter stuff that happened, I mean, it wasn't near the negative feedback for Bitcoin that you would have expected, but it was about as much publicity as you could expect. Yeah, I, and ultimately I said too, was the um, the wallets for miners, the basically the whale wallets. When the whale wallets start moving coin, that's when the apple cart gets tipped and the decision is made because that's what happened in 2018. We had, we had all this stuff swirling, we had zero volatility and all of a sudden a bunch of miners started selling and that's all it takes, right? Like, yeah. then everyone's like, all right, this is the move, this is the trade. We short, we sell, never. And it just is a positive feedback loop at that point. Yeah. I, I, I just don't think any, I still continue to think whatever dip we get, if it goes down, it'll be like a, you know, some kind of weak hands type of dip. Like the overall trend, I feel like still makes mo the most sense to go up unless the economy just totally dies. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, Biden getting elected and killing the market? Certainly possible. Uh, that's not priced in, obviously. <laughs> but all he's, I mean, he's way down in polls and stuff. So Trump, yeah. Uh, yeah, Trump is. And, you know, people, nobody believed the polls last time, but that doesn't mean that the polls are going to be wrong this time. That makes well, sense. You know, like Hillary was so Hillary was plus two last time uh, in the polls, and now Biden is plus nine right now. Yeah, and there's so there's room for things to change, but yeah, historically in politics, presidential races, it's really tough to come out of the type of economic times that we've faced. Not to mention, like you know, response feedback whether people think he's fit for the COVID response and all that. And nevertheless, I think people are probably underweighting the value of the polls because the polls were wrong last time. Although I think people gave people like Nate Silver too much crap last cycle because whenever they do that, it's all about probabilities, right? So it's like, well, the probability is that Hillary Clinton would win. It's not the certainty. It's that the odds are in her favor. That doesn't mean you win every time. Um, so for them to be wrong is just, uh, within the, it's just still within the parameters of the prediction. Um, and it could yeah, be the same a, now, except for the, it's, it's a wider window if everything stays the same as it is today. Well, there's just so many factors of polling. There's methodology, there's people who actually show up versus people who you poll. There's uh, yeah. voter, voter suppression in general, all this other stuff going on, you know? Yeah. I do think there's, um. You know, there's some stage three vaccine trials that are starting to be tested now. Um, and I think there's a lot of opt cautious optimism in the medical community, it seems, in terms of being able to get different, you know, different, different vaccines out there and doing things. So there's room for some good news to occur uh, that could tip the scales in terms of people's favorability and all that. Nevertheless, not a political podcast, but I certainly think the outcome of the election will be impactful on markets. Um, and I think the outcome of the election is going to be reliant on the state of the economy and uh, the state of COVID. Like if co I mean, COVID is rolling through the South and the uh, West right now, big time. We're getting parabolic, all-time high, new death, new cases, hospitalizations, all of the above where I live. Um, so yeah, one last thing I'll say about Corona is I was looking at this. Um, it was an NFL, they're talking about NFL teams and like where they're located. Yeah. 
And then, uh, so they put that up, that's what these circles on the map are mm -hmm. versus uh, cases per day. And I was thinking, yeah, these are all red states basically. <laughs> yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in November if this continues, you know, how long can this last? Can it last four months? Yeah. As far as the cases like this? I think the leading indicator from an economic perspective too could end up being following closely about what schools are doing because one of the big reasons I'm a parent, one of the big reasons for people not being able to work or not being able to do things is if their kids are in school or not. Um, yeah. So if we see more about kids not being able to be in school, well, that makes it harder for people to be at work and it makes it harder for the cycle of business to occur. And I think that could spell downward momentum for the economy as well. So I think trying to think through some, what are some leading economic indicators to determine, you know, what, what's the economic impact follow through going to be. I think that'll be important. Um, from a purely technical perspective, it seems like the V recovery is on and the Fed did its job <laughs> propping the market fully and are propping the economy, getting people cash, you know, cash, giving people cash flow, things like that. I just don't know if it's a house of cards or not. You know, like we're going to see. You don't know. Of course it's a house of cards. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, I, I do think it's a house of cards, but you can get away with it. Uh, of course, but not forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, people, like we're people, seeing people made similar claims in 2010, 2011. But look I, at every metric you can look at I regarding. I'm with you. I'm with unemployment you. I, regarding mortgages regarding car payments. Like it's all just skyrocketing delinquencies. Yeah. I don't know that's going to re result in like some 30 to 40 percent down move in the stock market. I guess is what I'll say. Sure. Yeah. I do think like, we'll see a realistic return in the economy. I don't. I also don't know like. Is inflation going to increase to justify things like the housing boom that's been occurring? Um, or are housing prices going to come down to meet inflation? But relative to inflation, housing prices are back to like 06 levels. Super crazy stuff. I mean, there's so and but then bankruptcies are up. Like er, there's so many things that are off. There was a Bloomberg article that was pretty good that I shared on Twitter the other day that talked about some of these divergences and – Mm -hmm. The banks are all kind of baffled right now because they're like, <laughs> we don't know what's going on. We just know we're not making near as much money as we normally do. <laughs> you know? I thought Goldman made like four billion last quarter. Um, I'd have to pull up this Bloomberg article again. I'll check it out. I did see thirty-year mortgages are near an all-time low right now. As for interest rates, it's like two point six eight percent or something. Yeah, I was asking on on Twitter about. Um, What's the deal with the housing boom? I got some pretty good responses from it, um, you know, indicating like it's got to be because uh, inventories are really low. So like price can go up because inventory is low, not necessarily because demand is high, you know. Um, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, a thirty-five billion dollar bite from U.S. bank profits. So I don't even know what's that what that's relative against. But uh, it says things are about to get ugly, but nobody knows how ugly. <laughs> Jamie Dimon quoted in this article. Thanks, Jamie. Um, anyway, it's just there's a lot of weird stuff, and I don't know how that's going to play out. Yeah. Um, you I know, agree. I, I tend to be one of those people that thinks if you just put everything in a vacuum, then, you know, a deflationary environment and a contraction in the economy and a contraction in the stock market makes the most sense. But whether that'll be true, I don't know. Probably depends on how much money we print and how we see the effects roll out over time. Like, you know, even after we got to what 10% unemployment or whatever after the Great Recession, the jobs coming back take forever. And we're already seeing those impacts now that, it, it, you know, it's not like people just rebound right back to their jobs. There's a lot of reasons why they do not. So I think it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, uh, a lot of weird stuff going on. Oh, hold on a second. There's a, here's this quote that I wanted to say. All right, so a $600 weekly unemployment benefit for, mil for millions of Americans is set to expire at the end of July. $669 billion financing program for millions of small businesses is slated to end early next month. 
a Goldman Sachs survey of borrowers of those borrowers found that 84% expect to exhaust their funding by the first week of August, and only 16% are confident they can keep paying staff without more support. So only 16% are confident they can keep paying staff without more bailouts. Like that doesn't yeah. seem good. <laughs> and it's pretty bad. Well, it goes back to the mortgage thing too. Apparently uh, there was this, I forget the percentage of people who underpaid. I mean, we're seeing even like retail. Um, people not paying their uh, leases. Their rent. Stuff. Yeah. Like retail not paying leases, uh, Cheesecake Factory and like Nordstrom saying they're going to pay half the rent and all this other stuff. So it's like, if they're not making it, there's no way Joe Schmo is making it, you know? Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, this is where the, the priorities are for White House. It's like <laughs> payroll tax, capital gains tax. Um, they want to cut the unemployment down from where it is they're talking about stimulus checks but they're going to be smaller than 1200 i think um that's at least what i heard the latest that i heard yeah i mean there's some stuff that they could do probably pretty easily that would be fascinating like you know the ppp loans were based on two and a half months of payroll like that's how it was calculated um so i i could imagine a world where they say hey we're giving everybody another two and a half months or something you know like where they just send everybody the same check that they already got <laughs> like i could totally imagine that world existing um yeah. amongst a lot of other options like there's a lot of ways to get people money <clears throat> like cash app no uh yeah I, I don't know it's just a giant mess nothing makes sense yeah and crypto is just sideways for the most part <laughs> yeah uh lola said is netflix the first domino in tech and I actually think that's a pretty interesting question. Uh, we did start to see the queues lag a little bit, even though they're, I mean, they look, they're really strong on like a quarterly basis, but the weekly had a pretty nasty red candle, the daily consolidating, looking like it could move down. Netflix disappointed in their earnings. Um, I thought they over, they, they disappointed in the future subscribers, I thought, or whatever. Yeah, either they, way, they went, the stock went down. Yeah. Number, yeah. number go down. <laughs> Number go down. You're right. Um, but my my point in that is, will it will expectations of decreased earnings matter to the degree where the stocks go down and people aren't willing to pay those valuations? If so, then there's a significant return to mean play that's possible across uh, tech, including uh, you know big tech like the Fang type stuff. What is it, Fang Man now? Yeah, Fang. I think Fang Man or F Fat Fang Man or I don't know. I forget what the A stands for in the man, but it's like Microsoft something Nvidia. There's yeah, there's Apple and Amazon. Yeah, I was just looking at silver and gold again. Uh, silver still looks really good from a white coffee in perspective. Yeah, I admit mean, it does. I shorted it yesterday. What? <laughs> I just, it was a return to mean play. And I don't I'll know. expect that from you. Yeah. Even it's a, look at this weekly 5200 cross. It I'm looks great. I know. I'm still long silver, or I'm still long uh, gold miners on long term accounts. I just was playing a little return to mean thing on shorter term stuff, and I'm thus far losing. All right. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, the big thing for me for BTC is this this edge to edge move that looks more and more convincing. Day yeah, by day here, the TK cross is uh, widening a bit, so it's it would take more for the recross to occur, right? Yeah, it's um, you know it's dynamic support resistance, so anything could happen if we stay sideways as far as is this cross happening again. But the way the cross is situated right now with price above a fat cloud that does not bode well for the long side right now yeah. you know that could change but as we sit here right this second this says get ready to short the hell out of this thing <laughs> yeah uh counterpoint to that and i know bitcoin and gold aren't the same thing but my goodness look at gold i, I just i know i just said i shorted silver but this consolidation and flag the failure to break down on gold I mean, this has got to be the move coming, right? Right? Surely. Is it? it? I mean, look at the daily div, though, as I continue to point that out. I know you do, but... 
Look at the daily. I don't look at this. Cup rising of, wedge. Look at this cup of glory. Cup of the cup runneth over. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It looks. It, it's. Yeah, I mean, look it, at those it green needs, candles. It needs to retrace. I'm not saying it does not. It, but it it just refuses to. Well, can you imagine the headlines? Gold breaks all time high. Like, that's gonna bring people in for sure. Yeah, I think that'll bring people. I think gold all time high. People will naturally treat Bitcoin as a derivative of gold. I just think they will. So okay, if we get over 1900 gold, I feel like it's gonna force a push even for Bitcoin, even though we haven't seen that correlation hold that well. It's just so steep, this rise. It is. It's extraordinarily but, steep. Maybe it's, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's actually taking into account what's going on in the world, you know? Yeah. And the, my long-term accounts have not get, gotten rid of the gold miners because I mean, the monthly is just ridiculous. It's an amazing Adam and Eve right there. Uh, isn't it? Yeah, it looks really good. Uh, and I've been in this most of the way. I got out of it but uh, for a little bit and got in cheaper on this previous monthly. And now I'm already up another like 15% on this monthly. It's, cra it's crazy. Like I'm getting better returns out of gold miners with no additional exposure than if I just had everything in the S&P. So I don't know. People always call me like a perma bear and crap, but I think I'm outperforming the S&P right now with a long only portfolio and long term accounts. So I'm not upset. I'm just, but I'm keeping like 70% of my dollars in dollars and using the 30% on stuff that I'm willing to be long on, which is gold miners. Hey man, if it works. But I have no, I just have no confidence because when I was talking about the expense of the queues and all that, I have no confidence in this. Like, it's crazy. I agree. And that fits the Bitcoin, you know, the last domino to fall is legacy going bye-bye. Yeah. What's this pitchfork you're showing me? Pretty Have you uh, looked, at, looked at Link lately? <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks toppy. I, I agree. That's what I said on Twitter. Did you read that activist short seller thing at all? No. Uh, it was like a 60-page Zeus Capital this is why Link's a scam. And I, like, I agreed with most of it, but uh, the big thing again is the accumulation of wallets off chain. So there are a ton of whales accumulating. Well, it could be just one whale accumulating multiple addresses. Um, but if you look at the chain analysis of it, it's taking a bunch of Link off exchanges and that's a bullish, you know, if bringing coin to an exchange is bearish, taking it off is bullish. So that's what we're seeing here, I think. Yeah. I mean, I just know I drew this pennant like, hey, I should get in this. And then I didn't touch it. And yeah. it's just doubled since then. <laughs> like, this is old school Bitcoin, draw a triangle, break up, profit. <laughs> and I'm like, Why are we not doing this? What's wrong with us, Josh? I I just can't trust the 4chan meme, you know? It's a, I'm, what's, I'm it's too a, smart. It's a 4chan That's why. meme? That's why I didn't make money. I'm too smart. <laughs> I didn't know it was a 4chan meme. Oh, yeah. The Link Marines are out in force on 4chan. Oh, really? Yeah, just tweet something bearish about Link and you'll see what I mean. Uh, tell me about ADA, because, you know, we talked about everything being new, being the ones that pump. ADA seems to be standing out from that, up over 100%. Uh, what are, are they doing stuff? Like, I should, I should ask Beast, I guess. <laughs> but, like, what what's causing them to have this type of momentum? So they, over the past few months, have rotated the fundamentals towards proof of stake. Um, and right now it's still a test net. Let me just pull up the article I did. Uh, right now it's still a test net. So the coins you get are not uh, unlocked. So basically you're collecting a, a reward for something you can get at a later date. Um, mm -hmm. I expect when the coins become unlocked that that'll slow down that's significantly. When, that's when the dump will occur. Yeah, let me just pull up. Uh, let me just find that graphic. Okay. So incentivized testnet started wherever, I don't know, months ago. Mm -hmm. 
So that's been rolling along. The hard fork happens July approximately 30. at the end of the month. And then the rewards become available August 3rd. So I think on August 3rd. It's game over. Yeah. I think something's going to happen for sure, right? Yeah, Just, you, you would think. You'd expect. Supply demand. Um, and then like actual staking starts apparently on August 18th. I got gotcha. you. But it's interesting to me. You compare that to old school coins. I know we've harped on this over and over again, but you look at LTC, you look at uh, XRP, you look at Zcash, you look at Monero. They all look like just garbage bags of nothing still. What? Monero looks fine. Fine. Zeek actually. Yeah, sure. They look fine, but they're not go they're not they're not going up. They're not participating in the fun. Well, you answered your own question. You know, Cardano has all this press about switching to proof of stake, even though they're still centralized. Whereas those other coins, especially LTC, like what is going on with LTC? Nothing. You so know, what is going on with Ripple? Let me, Nothing. Let me rephrase my question. <laughs> Do you think that this rotation between them could go all the way until uh, the quote big caps are displaced, like a, a flipping of big caps occurs where you're you know, your EOSs and your ripples and your light coins fall by the wayside and there are still leaves upside for Link and Tezos and Ren or, you know, whatever, whatever one's cream rises to the top. Because um, that would leave room for a lot more upside because even Link is, is it even over a billion dollar market cap? Um, uh, it's in the top 10, right? Yeah, but I think... To get to the say top five and displace a, a, a you know Litecoin or something like that, I think you got to get more like four or five billion. So at least, I, I it makes me in disbelief. But uh, people would have said that about Ethereum when it was at you know eighty cents. So eleven dollars could be what we've seen so far. Like this could Ethereum at eleven dollars could be Link now. Is my point. And like, it what's could, it all the Link people want you to think? Sure. Yeah, I'm just saying, but I'm saying there's a there is potential there. You consider we still don't even have retail, like you know what I mean. Like there's, I don't want to discount the fact that Link could keep going. That's what my point. No, I agree. Chains that are doing something have an advantage over chains that are doing nothing. You know, right? No matter how ridiculous that something is, like proof of stake. It's like okay, who cares, right? Yeah, um, it's all about supply and demand. So if they're sucking supply in some fashion out of the ecosystem. Then that's bullish. And even on yeah. a weekly chart, I, I mean, it depends on how you draw it, but like I drew a long time ago a uh, horizontal that I said looked like one of the most bullish charts I've ever seen, but then it languished for like 10 weeks kind of over the level. But if you consider what we just had, a more proper breakout, this is only really the second week of a breakout on a weekly basis after... A long time with a grinding upward consolidation it just it trades the most like a legacy market asset that i've seen even relative to bitcoin which makes it even more ridiculous against usd so for, for whatever your bad things you said about link being a scam which may be true from a price action perspective it's a dream and i should have been trading it this whole time i, I that's where like you have to put some of your inhibitions at the door if you want to actually trade this stuff uh, versus sitting on the sidelines because you think it's a scam, you know? Yeah. Um, what's the longest chart with USD link on it? Is yeah, it I don't one? know. I couldn't find anything. I just yeah. was using Binance. Um, this is the MA multiple for link. And it likes, it likes 1180. This keeps going up, you know? Yeah. So... The good times are going to keep rolling for Link, I um, think. We got a question from uh, something something Girl Crib. Sorry, I can't pronounce it. We were talking about this before the show, too. If we have thoughts on Adam and Cosmos. And I would say it's similar as in, like, it's getting a uh, pretty well-regarded, you know, community, pump of minerals, you know, whatever, <laughs> staking. That's heavy air quotes. Community. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'm just saying. 
Um, I'm I, holding it, so I'm with you, but, you know, yeah, whatever. I had this trade idea a long time ago. Uh, I got in on the break of the line, and I got out when it looked like it was failing it up here, and then I ignored it for like a month, and uh, then it was to my peril because the if I would have looked back at that same level of entry, I could have gotten back in for a really nice gain, and I ignored it. So, um, yeah, I'm interested in Adam. I think it's even worse from a valuation perspective than link because i think whether you're looking at i think adam has like really high returns built into that for their early investors already obviously that's not the only thing in the world but it just makes me a little nervous if people are so far in profit that they can just slow dump on people and be happy the whole way whereas if somebody is less in profit than the uh, they might have stronger hands, you know? Yeah, I agree. That's why um, one good thing to always pay attention to is the percentage of addresses in the money. And yeah. if it reaches like 80 plus percent, typically that's uh, reversal territory, right? Because people just take profit at that point. At, at what percent? I don't know. I'm just picking like 70, 80%. Um, I see. That's this website into the block. They have stats on this. It might require a paid account, but um, uh, yeah, you can look at like in the money and out of the money yeah, to like really make, cool. make a decision as far as like, look at link <laughs> in the money is uh, we can pull it up. Everybody's in the money. 96% in the money. <laughs> like, feels, of course it's at all time high, but yeah, um, feels good you know, to own link. Feels concentration good. by large holders, 80%. This is part of the, uh, let me see if I can find. Oh, this is where that simulation came from for uh, people dumping. Uh, is it? I don't comp. think, I think it was a different website. Similar, but different Go, website. Scroll down to concentration. It, or, or you were just, you, I, I just saw it somewhere. It looked like it, but nevertheless, yeah. Similar concept. And you can see whales volume. Yeah. A another thing I like to pay attention to is, where is it at? Is it ownership? By time held, I think. Yeah, so if if the new holders, the less than one month people, make up a significant portion of the chain, that's typically a toppy sign as well. It's at twenty percent right now. That come John uh Crichton said the yearly R5 pivot for Link USD is at 1280. For listeners at home, R5 is like a extension upwards that is extraordinary to reach. <laughs> but R1 is 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 a nice play. Uh, R5 is obscene. So yeah, it's mega mooned. Yeah. Yeah. So those are just some on-chain stuff you can look at to say like how crazy this move has been. Yeah, I think the thing I want to do is identify like what are some things that have those native fans built in that are going to be the 2020 versions, you know, that maybe they've already had a good move and I'm ignoring them and they've got a lot more to go because market cap wise, they can do it. Got my eye on a couple of them, but uh, you got to watch out for that stuff because there's, there's some plays out there where you can make a crap ton of money if you pay attention to the fundamentals when I say fundamentals, I don't mean the true fundamentals. I mean the, the you know, pump fundamentals. Um, and yeah, there's opportunity out there, but you gotta you gotta know what you're waiting through because for every one that's a link, there's you know, fifty that's garbage. Well, yeah, link S and X, Ave, yeah. those are all outliers compared to yeah. There was like the there were like it. four coins out of hundreds in 2018 or whenever it was. So. Yeah, I'm just looking at all these <laughs> OMG, like 99% out of the money icon, 99% out of the yeah. money. And those were super hyped, you know, like. Yeah. Loop ring. That's a, that's a cool website, into the block.com. IOST. Hashtag not a sponsor. They, uh, Electronium, wasn't that like a wallet uh, or something? Electronium, yeah, I think it is. Um, We're partnered with, uh, BNC is partnered with them, but. Well, their coin's pretty dead. 
It looked, no, I mean, uh, Into the Block, we're partnered with. Oh, oh I see. I thought you meant Electronium. <laughs> no, no. Um, oh, so, uh, yeah. cool. Somebody sent me the website with the simulation. It's flipsidecrypto.com. Uh, so these are 30-day net asset flows. That's cool for Link. So you can see it tossing. You can see them tossing around between exchanges, uh, top, you know, top holders, less active wallets, their foundation or investors. That's really cool. Thank you to Ajay Egg, AJ. I'm going with AJ. And that's not an easy task to like label all that stuff for all these coins. So yeah. I'm surprised this is a free, free thing that they do. But yeah, I've got no idea how accurate it is, but. Yeah, these are neat. We'll link these up in the show notes for people listening, but it could be the type of thing that would be good to check out for your, uh, uh, you know, flavor of the week. I think it's, I do think it's the type of thing that could be useful if you're looking to swing some of these. Yeah, it's super interesting, especially that comp one. <laughs> that comp one is great. Yeah, it is. All right, so I want to talk a minute, not long, because the whole world saw it, but. Uh, I want to talk a minute about the Twitter Bitcoin thing. And this hacker got a hold of basically every account they wanted to touch. They just didn't, they didn't touch Donald Trump's cause it seemed like that was a little too scary, but they got Joe Biden. They got Barack Obama. They got, uh, tons of famous people, but it all started with a, uh, tweet from Angelo BTC for a paid group. And then it moved on to, you know, others up to Elon Musk was probably the most influential and they posted it a bunch of times. So someone had essentially root level access to post tweets on behalf of people. And uh, Twitter had, had to go all the way to the point of shutting down verified accounts just to disincentivize the hacker to actually post places. And all of them pointed to essentially trying to get people to send them Bitcoin. Um, Bullish or bearish? I got. I don't have any real questions, but what do you? <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, it was like a slow moving train wreck um, to watch it real time. It, it's like it's like who's gonna get hit next? Um, it is super fascinating, though, don't you think? Like, it's a sign of the times, maybe. I, I don't know. It's weird that they chose Bitcoin of all things to to get. Like, they could have done much worse things. Oh yeah, the right. Fact like. <laughs> Yeah, there were lots of people that noted how considering how who they hacked and what they could have said and could have done, they either weren't in it for the money or they were really dumber than you would have thought because they could have moved markets just with the tweets. Like they could, you know, Elon Musk and they could have talked about some kind of acquisition or bankruptcy or anything and affected this price of Tesla or you know, even with Bitcoin, they hacked the Bit at Bitcoin account or, or they hacked, you know, they did Coinbase and they did a bunch of others. You know, they could have done listing scams. They could have done tons of stuff where they could have made millions of dollars and some of them in sneaky ways on, you know, DEXs or, or having prepared so many things they could have done with that access. So it's not about the money to me, but we did see Bitcoin on a lot of people's Twitters, including in follow-ups, you know, like, Biden say, you know, I don't own any Bitcoin and I'm not going to ask you to donate Bitcoin to me, <laughs> which is crazy. Uh, yeah, I just thought it was fascinating to see Bitcoin on, on every tongue. And I think it, re it reiterated to me the network effect for Bitcoin and the brand recognition. And I mean, I think that brand recognition that widespread is pretty impressive considering how few dollars are in Bitcoin. And that's kind of my primary takeaway. Yeah, I mean, I just was a casual observer. Super interesting. Because it's not like people were saying, what's Bitcoin? You know, that's not what people said. Well, it's, it, it had to have been poorly planned because why the hell would you start with Angelo BTC of all people, right? Like, yeah, it, it's like it's like they didn't oh. realize the power they had until... Until it was happening. Until it was happening. And they were like, and oh, they, we can do they, anything. Yeah, they were like, ah, I need to Google real quick. What were those Nigerian, you know, send me one, I'll send you two scams and put my BTC address in. I agree. It seemed it, maybe they just fell upon it and didn't realize what they had, so they didn't plan it. I don't know. It was crazy, though. It was crazy. 
Um, it also says the power of Twitter these days, you know, like Twitter for a lot of people is their identity, including me. Like that's part of your identity. Yeah. I mean, and people were saying like Twitter can move markets and start wars. I don't think it can really it'd be pretty sad if it truly started wars, but it can certainly move markets. In fact, it absolutely does. Um, so they could have take, taken advantage of it financially way more than they did. Um, I just thought it was neat seeing Bitcoin being in each of those and it not being like people saying, what is Bitcoin? So I feel like the awareness of what Bitcoin is being so widespread is fascinating. And I'm not going to say like that hack was bullish, but it was affirm <laughs> it was reaffirming to me that knowing what Bitcoin is, is not really the battle. It's more about convincing people that Bitcoin is something worth investing in, you know? Well, it had value to somebody. That's why they were trying to get it from people, right? Yeah, I guess so. But it wasn't it wasn't a user hack. It wasn't a Bitcoin hack. It was a it was a Twitter hack, really. You know, yeah, it was definitely somebody... it was definitely a Twitter hack and it was not a Bitcoin scam, which was obviously the headline everywhere. People and arguably, it wasn't even a hack. You know, it probably was just a social engineered thing where they had access to some panel that yeah. probably shouldn't even exist on Twitter. You know? Yeah, yeah. There was def whoever it was definitely had way too much God mode access. Mm -hmm. um, all right, you got this Bitcoin chart. This is your. We already talked about this, but yeah. Yeah. I, seven two. I want to. I don't know. Seven two. I, what it, What is your uh, screw this? I'm going long type price. Screw this, I'm going long is when we recross the TK above the club. So 9,600-ish? It depends. I mean, it's it's probably going to be above 9.5, yeah. Yeah. But and, and for me, I'm still kind of in the same boat as I was, even though I think, like you said, if you get above 9.5 or so, it'll probably breach the level I'm interested in as well. But the weekly high of 10, 10.150, 10.2, I need to see a weekly close above that. And I think that we um, have another $1,500 at bare minimum, but I don't think that that high will hold either if we break the first one. Um, but I agree with you. I have a I have a red shaded box around 95, 9,600. It was kind of the bottom side of the consolidation from uh, late summer, early fall 2019 at 10K, above 10K. I feel like if we break above the lower boundary of that, that's the signal for the move to me. Whether we hit 7K first, I don't know, man. I still don't know. <laughs> like, I hope not because <laughs> I'm in. Well, but when we consolidate like this, the the um, outcomes are super wide. So I'm seeing I'm, it's either 13 if we go up or 7 1 if we go down, you know? And right now it's leaning down. Yeah. That's just how it is. That's why I historically hate Bollinger Band plays because <laughs> the but, moves are typically brutal and happen super quickly. So it's like, if you're not right, you're super wrong. And if you're not in, you're late, right? Yeah. So Histo it's just tough. That's why I, that's why I started that uh, breakout bot that I've been using is trying to capture that. Um, the problem is whether it's that or whether it's saying buying options, you know, you know, you buy a long straddle, which is yeah. basically volatility either way you profit. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is if it stays super low volatility for the duration of your option or you still lose, you know, right. <laughs> or yeah. if it continues to wick any of the minor breakouts, you continue to lose. So, uh, it's still very hard to trade. This is, I would not say this is easy to trade. So I feel like you gotta be either out and prepared to market buy on a dip or a, a, a breakout to the upside. Or if you're in, be prepared to, you know, get out and then maybe have to get back in at the same price or something like that, or be it back in higher if you're wrong, like that type of thing. Um, but I, unfortunately, I think as much as I don't want it to, I think this consolidation could give us a lot of fake outs and continue to do this for several more weeks. Yeah, the 31st is the CME contract. So we usually see a move a couple of days before the rollover. Yeah, which would indicate next week. Is it? Is that next week already? Ish. Uh, Two weeks. Yeah. Next, I'd week's, say about the, next week's expiry is the 24th, I think. 
by the 28th, we should know where we're going. <laughs> yeah. So if we still haven't really moved by next week, next week we should be making some more volatility oriented plays. But it yeah. might it might give us yet another week of uh, alt's ability to move. Uh, you it's got true. one more chart up that you're looking at. Oh, this is timeline for all it's those. It's the CME experts. thing. Yeah. Cool. So I think longing volatility next week is the play. I think. I like it. Um, that leaves us in mostly a holding pattern for right now. Yeah, it's just a bunch of nothing. Uh, well, that's okay. You know, we can be patient. Patience is a virtue. It's true. Um, all right, so we will leave it there, but I want to pull up Josh's YouTube channel first. Y'all check out at Carpe Noctum on YouTube. He puts out regular videos, including the uh, ones just at 4 a.m. last night altcoin extravaganza episode 14 fomo and froth so go check that out and uh check out the ledger status channel as well where we put these videos and try to upload some other stuff too sometimes um with that said follow us on twitter yada 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 thanks for joining us and uh yeah i guess we'll look forward to catching you next time huh sounds good thanks josh If anybody's still here, I just got a notification from the New York Times saying, hackers tell the story of the Twitter attack from the inside. Several people involved in the events that took down Twitter this week spoke with the New York Times. What might have been a pursuit of Bitcoin spun out of control. So <laughs> that's a fun one. So they talked apparently, to them. Apparently Angelo and Kobe spoke with the Wall Street Journal as well. So that's awesome. How our worlds are colliding. Nice. All right. See y'all later.